All right, good afternoon. We'll get started. I have no announcements today, so we can dive right into the lecture. Today we're going to embark on a double lecture, in fact, uh, about transcription and transcriptional regulation. Our uh, clinical disease wrapper is twofold. We're going to talk about diabetes, and we'll also talk about those vitamin B12 shots that the baseball players took in the 90s. First, we'll talk about diabetes. Diabetes or diabetes uh, mellitus, that's Latin for sweet, and I'll talk about where the sweet comes from in just a bit, is a metabolic disorder. It's a little bit odd because to talk about diabetes, considering we haven't talked about metabolism yet. I'm going to try to avoid any of the terminology you'll ultimately be responsible for in the fourth quarter. So we're going to give you just uh, what you need to be able to understand the clinical condition, but then keep some of the topics that I mention in mind because uh, they're going to come back for future use in the fourth quarter. It's a metabolic disease, and it is characterized by a term that's right on here of hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is high levels of circulating blood sugar. And the reason why individuals with diabetes have high levels of circulating blood sugar is because they, the cells in their body and their endocrine system is not uh, properly processing their ability to uptake nutrients from the bloodstream, namely the sugar. So if it doesn't go into the cells, it accumulates in the bloodstream. Thus, we have diabetes. Insulin, I set this up as a rhetorical question. We have a general understanding that insulin helps with blood sugar control. That's why diabetics take it, and they monitor their blood sugar and try to dose with the appropriate amount of insulin to keep it under control. What the insulin does, this is an endocrine hormone. We talked about endocrine uh, in one of the earlier quarters. It circulates in our body, and when cells that have insulin receptors uh, sense that insulin, it sets off a variety of signaling pathways inside the cell, some of which you'll hear uh, in passing later on in this uh, course. But for the purposes of today, one of the major things that it does is enable that cell to uptake glucose from its environment. There are certain transporters. We did transporters in an earlier quarter that transport the, the sugar from the bloodstream inside the cell. And the insulin signaling also sets up the metabolic state of the insulin receiving cell to be able to process that cellular sugar now into the building blocks of ATP synthesis, energetics, nucleotides, all things that you've heard various points in this course. Um, therefore, high blood sugar or hyperglycemia, I want you to equate to cellular starvation. So there's sugar, sugar everywhere in the bloodstream, and that's because the cells are not getting enough nutrients um, via the same bloodstream. And this is because of problems with insulin. The long-term hyperglycemic condition, cellular starvation uh, condition, gives rise to long-term uh, damage in a variety of tissues. I'll speak a little bit about the eyes, a little bit about the kidneys, and some of the neuropathic uh, defects as well as the defects in the cardiovascular system. A couple of terms here introduce for those with pre-med aspirations and also introduce to relate back to the characteristics of the disease. Polyuria or frequent urination. Why would this be associated with diabetes? I talked about the increase in blood circulating blood sugar. That's a sugar as a solute, even if you dissolve it in plasma. And as a result of the increase in sugar in the bloodstream, when the blood gets filtered through the kidneys, that leads to an increase in sugar in the urine. And here's where the gross part of the diabetes mellitus comes. The old physicians still want to be a doctor a couple hundred years ago. Take the urine of an individual who you wonder if has uh, diabetes or not and taste it. If it's sweet, that probably means they have diabetes, excess blood sugar. 
where the frequent urination comes from, why do the individuals need to go to the bathroom all the time? More of that sugar into the urine is a solute, creates an osmotic gradient across the kidney. I don't know if you guys have done all your nephron physiology and things yet in your courses. Um, but more solute in the urine creates a driving force for water to leave the bloodstream and go into the urine. So you pee a lot. You're also very thirsty. That's called polydipsia. So chronic thirst, that's the comes along with the polyuria. Weight loss, impaired growth, these are all nutrient deprivations relating to the cellular starvation that I talked about before. Ketoacidosis has a um, much more specialized definition, which I'll try to mention in passing now, but we'll, you'll see in more gory detail when we cover metabolism. Um, when, as a result of the cells adapting from the lack of sugar, because they can't uptake it from the bloodstream, they metabolize other nutrients that they have access to, namely fats. And as the fats break down, a byproduct of the fat breakdown is uh, this thing called a ketone body. People are taking organic chemistry. It's a functional, ketone is a functional group. I'll show you in a couple of weeks what it, what it looks like. Um, ketone bodies and keto acids, which are byproducts of this fat breakdown. The keto acids can accumulate, acidify the bloodstream, that's the acidosis, and the ketones themselves are very fragrant, and so this is another clinical manifestation and how a doctor might, if they don't feel like tasting urine, they might uh, do is you, you can smell on the individual's breath a more uh, fruity aroma, and that's because they are evolving ketones out of them as a result of them circulating in the bloodstream. So those are the things in, in, a, in a diabetic state. Speak a bit about the long-term complications. Retinopathy, these, this is, these are diseases of the retina, and the disease of the retina, the diabetic ret retinopathy, arises from these very fine blood vessels that are in the backs of our eyes that keep our retina um, oxygenated. It's a very um, a strong oxygen requirements in, in the retina. And as a result of that cellular starvation, these begin to die. And if they begin to die, then the retina begins to die for lack of oxygen delivery because the vessels aren't there to be able to deliver it. And this is how blindness can ultimately result. The uh, diabetic neuropathies, this is another area where the fine grain uh, circulation comes into play and then secondarily impacts the neurons. Tips of our fingers, our heels, the tips of our toes are, are as far as we need to go in our circulatory system from our heart. And by consequence of that, these are the very finest capillaries in our, um, in our body. Those also are the ones that are susceptible to cellular starvation. If you can't feel anything there, you can't sense damage, there's no feedback if you've stubbed your toe or done, um, incurred an injury. And so diabetic foot ulcers, things are very, very common, and it's a lack of oxygenation um, and the neural feedback in the tissues, and then you can have give rise to chronic um, ulcers that can lead to amputations. And we could go on, many of these things all stem from the same thing. So the cerebrovascular disease, we have you know, um, blood vessels in our brain, also very fine, also a very oxygen-rich, energy-rich tissue, all adversely affected by these fine, va the fine uh, vascular um, beds in that organ. The last part um, relating to lipoprotein metabolism, these are the lipids that circulate in our bloodstream to trans, uh, to shuttle fats around from cell type to cell type, organ to organ. These are secondary consequences of very high levels of the sugar, and I talked about how the fats are being metabolized by the cells. All that stuff gets messed up. Uh, and then the periodontal disease, all right, so chronic inflammation in our gums. A diabetic cells can't uptake circulating sugar, but bacteria sure can, because they don't have diabetes. And so they'll happily set up shop all along the gum line. Um, and then that, that gives rise to the chronic inflammation because these individuals will have more uh, a, a not good microbiome setting up along their, their dental structures. The prevalence and economic impact of diabetes are huge. I looked up the numbers again this morning. It's now 327 billion as of 2017 and 237 billion in 
direct expenditures in the United States alone. In the United States alone, roughly 2 million people diagnosed per year, new. And once you're diagnosed, you don't go back. And so this is a rolling uh, list of people on uh, the, the diabetes rolls. Uh, the prevalence in us, let's say, is 5 to 10 percent. Varies dramatically depending upon racial, ethnic uh, backgrounds. Of note, uh, we call it traditional cultures in developing nations have very low prevalence generally of diabetes, and the links between Western diet and one of the most prevalent forms of diabetes that I'll talk about in a moment um, are related to one another, and it relates to insulin handling and how we respond to when we consume a lot of sugar, carbohydrates, uh, and then process that through the cells in our pancreas. And then the fin final thing, I'll note just the bullet point there, is that there is evidence of genetic predispositions, and so there are uh, certain backgrounds that have extremely high um, uh, prevalences of diabetes, speaking to something heritable that may predispose uh, these different types of diabetes. The etiology of, of diabetes depends critically on which type of diabetes we're talking about. And there are two main categories. I'm going to introduce the two main categories, and the one that's of interest falls somewhere in between those two. Um, but we'll, we'll focus on the first two so that you're aware. Um, what's now commonly called type 1 diabetes used to be called uh, juvenile diabetes. And this is an autoimmune disease. You already know what autoimmune disease immune uh, disorders are. I'll give you the specifics on this one. It relates to an autoimmune attack on the insulin secreting cells in the pancreas, which is where the circulating insulin comes from. The cells that are in the pancreas that secrete insulin are called beta cells. There, is, uh, there are autoantigens on the beta cells that give rise to an autoimmune attack in children, a subset of children. As a result of that autoimmune attack, the beta cells are lost from the pancreas. No beta cells, no insulin secretion, diabetes. So there's this, this individual could, can respond just fine to insulin, but they can't make it unless the insulin shots. Interestingly, uh, uh, one of the prevalent autoantigens in type 1 diabetes is insulin itself. And so there's a clear link of why the beta cells would be the target of that autoimmune attack if you're having a B cell dependent antibody response to the hormone that we need to be able to handle blood sugar properly. The second type, type 2, adult or mature onset diabetes, is uh, different. Uh, and it's different because there is not the eradication of beta cells, um, but defects in the way in which insulin is handled or the information from insulin is transduced by our cells. So something wrong occurs with re respect to the regulation of insulin production and release or the way in which cells, when they're circulating insulin, respond to the insulin that they see. The example, which a little bit falls in b between these, uh, these two, is the one that we're going to, to talk about in this two-lecture series. is called MODI, which stands for Mature Onset Diabetes of the Young. And that's where it comes like sometimes called one and, type 1 and a half diabetes because it's <laughs> associated with younger individuals, but it's not associated with an autoimmune attack. It is a, an inherited defect in the ability to produce insulin. So it's an insulin deficiency, but it's not for the reasons that I spelled out in type 1. Another example, which I'll, I'll mention for complete, completeness, people heard of insulin-resistant diabetes. That's another category of type 2, arguably the most prevalent form. And these are individual, these are the, this is the type that's associated with uh, obesity, bad diet, lack of exercise, these kinds of things. And the, the thinking there is that the cells are always experiencing high levels of insulin because they're always trying to process the sugar that is circulating in their, uh, in their bodies. And then as a result of that, the cells become desensitized to the, uh, to the amount of insulin that the cells are able to produce. I see a question on the left, and I see one over on the right. 
this is the autoimmune um, attack of type 1 diabetes occur, can it occur in older individuals? Yeah, so the, um, the juvenile or early onset di diabetes, there's a window. Um, I mean, I have colleagues of mine whose children are getting afflicted with it. Um, the window can be from, I think it, it can be as early as toddler age all the way up until I'd probably want to say the teens, early teens. That's about the window. After that, um, You've already learned about the, the immune system and how the adaptive immunity and things. At that time, you're largely, uh, the body has received a lot of information from their, the outside environment. And so it's pretty rare after that point. You've already been tolerized to the insulin because for decades of living with it. It's rare to non-existent after that. <laughs> Why does gestational diabetes occur? Um, You've stumped me, and I should know this because my wife had it twice with both of our kids. Um, I can give you a speculative answer and, and thereby demonstrate how you think on your feet in front of 65 people. Um, insulin it relates to metabolism, and it's a pretty profound metabolic perturbation to have another organism growing inside you. Um, the, a, a, yeah, I don't know, but it could be even some things as trivial as like the mechanical forces, you know, the mechanics of, of pressure and the pancreas, which is right down, down in there. Although my recollection of gestational diabetes, will somebody help me with that door? Because I'm not that funny. Um, the onset happens in the first trimester, and so that the physical constraints there aren't quite so much. But you do have uh, another organism with nutrient needs, and um, all of the other pregnancy-associated hormones could also be interfering with insulin, with in insulin action. You've motivated me to look that up. Maybe I'll, give you, I'll try to give you an answer next time. All right. Kind of like the last one. How on earth am I going to relate these to transcriptional regulation? I'll keep you a little bit in suspense, but I will come back to it. And we'll also get to steroids as well introduction next class. Let's dive into transcription. Uh, as with the introductory of the whole central dogma, and as with the introduction of DNA replication, I'm going to give you a broad strokes overview of the major steps of transcription, the process of transcription, so making RNA from DNA. And then we'll zoom in on the individual steps to give more details. But you need to see the whole context, because you can get lost in the weeds. First, we'll begin with what we'll call a transcription unit. In eukaryotes, us, this is one gene. In prokaryotes, it can be and often is multiple genes in tandem. That has a name for it, but I won't tell you what it is until you need to know it. Um, but both of them, are, we'll consider them for now to be a transcription unit meaning the part of our, the genome that needs to be turned into RNA for transcription. Right? That transcription unit has either adjacent to it or within it two features that inform the polymerase, the RNA polymerase that makes the RNA transcript, where to start and where to finish. The genetic information that provides where to start is called the promoter by virtue of its ability to promote transcription. And then the sequence that tells the polymerase where to end is called the terminator, by virtue of its ability to tell when transcription should terminate. If a region of the genome, I'm not sure if this is blued somewhere, but I will routinely re refer to pieces of a, a genome as a locus, a site, a place. All right, so this, if this locus is going to be uh, transcribed, RNA polymerase um, will bind or get recruited to the promoter region of the transcription unit. More details on that to come. Once RNA polymerase has been brought to that promoter region, that's where it's going to start, it will unwind the DNA, so open up the two strands, and begin synthesizing RNA. RNA polymerases, like DNA polymerases, synthesize nucleic acids in the five prime to three prime direction. So fortunately, that doesn't 
that rule stays fast, even one polymerase to another. The monomers are not deoxynucleotide tri uh, nucleoside triphosphates. They are ribonucleoside triphosphates. But all the other same principles, same phosphoester backbone, synthesis five prime to three prime. The terminology for the two strands, we talked about parents and daughters with DNA replication. It's different for transcription, even though the strands are the same. One of the strands is going to be used as the template that, in, if you will, gives the information to RNA polymerase as to which base should be put into the RNA polymer. That's called the template strand. The opposite strand kind of comes along for the ride. Nothing really happens to it, but it's called the co and it's called the coding strand. I think I'll have a little bit more to say on this in a moment, but if you do the do the math, the RNA is anti-parallel to the template strand. The template strand is anti-parallel to the coding strand. So the coding strand and the RNA that's being transcribed are in the same orientation. And with regards to the code, between them, the only differences are that the T's go to U's when you go from DNA to RNA. But all the other A's and G's are the same, which is why the coding strand is convenient to access um, in terms of uh, inferring what the RNA should look like. You don't have to reverse comp it, reverse complement it, uh, like you would with the template strand. The RNA polymerase moves along the transcription unit. Going, keep going. There's a lot of simplicity with transcriptional initiate the, the actual process of transcription because RNA polymerase can do all of the stuff. It doesn't need all the help, like I talked about with DNA polymerase. It will go, 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 go until it transcribes a termination signal encoded by the terminator sequence. And then characteristics of that terminator sequence inform the RNA polymerase to unbind from that locus, and then transcription is done. Not too bad, right? All right, there's some details. There's a good number of details at each one of those steps. A few words about uh, prom promoters and a, an introductory uh, remark. I will focus my comments on prokaryotic transcription first and then come back and talk about eukaryotic transcription later. In DNA replication, I went back and forth between the two. Here, it's going to be a bit and then we'll go to eukaryotes, because eukaryotes is considerably more complicated, especially when we're talking about um, transcriptional regulation. So I already spoke about the, this notion of the template strand versus the coding strand. The RNA is synthesized off of the template strand, but the coding strand is the faster way to access what the RNA would look like because of the alignment of the the polymer. When I, and, and therefore, the, the reference frame of the ribosome, we take from the perspective of the coding strand. Even though it's doing chemistry based off of the template strand, it's moving in the five prime to three prime direction of the, um, the coding strand. Therefore, when I talk about upstream you know, something upstream of a transcription start side or downstream of something. Upstream will mean in the five prime direction of the coding strand. The promoter, as I said in my introduction, is where the RNA polymerase, are at. we'll talk about different RNA poles in, uh, uh, in a moment, bind to the DNA open it up, and then begin the transcription process. Promoters have consensus sequences. We saw consensus sequences briefly for origin. The notion of a consensus sequence is exactly the same. And in fact, there are many defined for transcriptional regulatory sites, like a promoter. An example of a bacterial one is shown here. And so what I might, you might hear me say if, is that if transcription starts here, the promoter is upstream of the transcription start site, and it's because we're on the five, up on the five prime end of the coding strand. 
a reminder of how these consensus sequences are defined. It's exactly the same as origin binding protein, uh, origins of replication, except now you're aligning promoter sequences or enhancer sequences, terminator sequences. These are the things I had talked about before. After the RNA polymerase has been, has bound to the promoter, there's an opening of the two DNA strands. There's a pausing to allow the opening to occur and to allow the first couple of nucleotides to be incorporated into the growing RNA polymer. RNA polymerase can do the unwinding. It can do the synthesis. And it can progress along the template strand, move along the transcription unit all by itself. There's no accessory proteins needed. There's some things that, that RNA polymerase will interact with. It needs help to figure out where it should access in the, the genome. But once it's there, it's off to the races. I already said that the monomers for transcription are uh, ribonucleoside triphosphates rather than deoxyribonucleoside tri triphosphates. Um, and the register there, there's it, within the RNA polymerase, about 10 or so bases that are filled up there, and then the polymerase will start moving. And the winding and unwinding happens in real time as the polymerase moves forward. The unwinding and the rewinding behind the polymerase don't require any additional energy. They don't require any additional factors. Helicases or gyrases are not needed. And they're not needed, I'll take you back to my rope analogy. If you just were to take your hand and put it in between the two strands of the rope and then slide it along, rope burn notwithstanding, you're not super coiling the DNA in front of it or behind it. You're just separating it for a short period of time, and you can move along. So this is partly the reason why there aren't any, um, there aren't the same energetic hurdles that need to be overcome as with DNA replication. So unwinding, rewinding, DNTP incorporation moves along. All right. It's elongating from five prime to three prime. That's the RNA synthesis, the polymer synthesis, like I said before. Recognizing that to move, or to synthesize in the five prime to three prime direction and the anti-parallel nature of the template, from the template's point of view, it's in the opposite direction. Eventually, I'll just stricken that entirely from the slide because most students just find it confusing. Think in terms of the DNA, uh, the RNA synthesized and the coding strand, and everything will be OK. But you just got to know where that information is coming from, which is the template strand. So a few brief words on the promoter, a few brief words on elongation. Transcriptional termination is um, something you haven't seen before, but it's not too bad. As I said, it's encoded in a consensus sequence at the end of the transcription unit. And it's, in fact, beyond simply a particular orientation of A, C's, G's, and T's, because the sequence itself has a biophysical property to it that is recognized either by the ribosome directly or by associated proteins that then interact with the ribosome and collectively provide the signal for transcriptional termination. And what is that biophysical property? And the biophysical property is um, what, uh, it, uh, here, I'll use the term that's on the slide, is that it's self-complementary. So self-complementarity of a sequence, what does that mean? It means if you, you, you always read nucleic acids, five prime to three prime direction. So if you're going five prime to three prime and you see a certain stretch of sequence, and then some other sequence, and then a little bit after that, you see the perfect reverse complement of the sequence that was before it. Simplest example, C, 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 some other amino acids, G, 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 G. Those two sequences can base pair with one another as long as there's enough space in the loop. And they're perfectly complementary to one another. And they're right on the same molecule. So very rapidly, you're going to zipper up and form what's called a hairpin. Base pairing, all the same stuff you talked about before. The only difference is that it is 
ribonucleic acid, and it's intramolecular rather than intermolecular. That hairpin zippering up is an example of RNA secondary structure. You heard secondary structure with proteins. Thematically, it's the same thing. It's, it's basically one step up for what RNA can, can do beyond its linear primary sequence. And a major one, the one you should be aware of, is this hairpin formation. So hairpin via its self-complementarity. And by forming the hairpin, you now have a geometric arrangement of those ribonucleic acids that's characteristic. It's different than just a wobbly worm of nucleic acid. That hairpin, depending upon the gene and depending upon the terminator sequence, can go back and bind directly to the ribosome and cause the ribosome to fall off. Or there are uh, intermediate proteins that um, are recogni that recognize that hairpin, and then upon binding the hairpin, they bind to the ribosome and tell the ribosome to fall off. So it's either one or two degrees of separation between the hairpin and the ribosome to trigger um, uh, dissociation from the DNA template and transcriptional termination. What this also means, and there are consensus sequences for these two, you can determine the ends of genes bioinformatically. You look for one of these hairpin sequences, you see if it conforms to a transcriptional termination sequence, and even if you've never studied the gene before, you can make an educated guess about where that transcript will stop. Now let's talk a little bit about eukaryotic specific transcription. All of the things that I talked about up to this point hold for both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes have some more wrinkles to them. Number one is that they have not one RNA polymerase, but three. And the three RNA polymerases make major categories of RNA that's good to be aware of. The major one that you see is blue is Pol2. And, Paul, and the reason why Paul 2 is important is because Paul 2 makes messenger RNA, the RNA that is used as a template for protein synthesis. And we're in central dogma world, right? And so we need to go from DNA to RNA and then RNA to protein. It's mRNA that's in that intermediate um, state to get us to protein. But there are other RNAs that cells make. We need to make our RNA, ribosomal RNA, when we talk about translation, I'll show you structure of the ribosome. There's a lot of RNA in there, mostly RNA, in fact. And those ribosomal RNAs are synthesized by RNA Pol1. And they are assembled in the nucleolus of our cells. So the little dense patches, phase separated uh, organelles within the nucleus. If you ever looked at an image of a cell, you'll see two or three dark patches in there, those are the nucleoli. That's where um, ribosomal RNA gets synthesized and assembled into ribosomes. And I have uh, one other additional note here to remind, when I'm talking about pre-RNA, pre-mRNA, pre-tRNA, that means that the first pass biosynthetically of the RNA polymerase to make the nascent RNA strand for each one of these, there's a whole series of modifications, chemical modifications that take place to create the mature ribosomal RNA, mRNA. We'll focus on the mRNA. Did I see a hand in the, okay, I just saw maybe a stretching in the back. And then the third one, uh, which you'll see a little bit more are uh, in when we do translation, are uh, called tRNAs, transfer RNAs that relate RNA sequence to amino acid uh, sequence, important for translation. Uh, those are made by RNA Pol3. Each one of those polymerases conforms to the general principles that I talked about in the past few slides, but then the details vary. Promoter consensus sequences differ. Terminators probably have a little bit different flavor uh, uh, to them. These are some of the things that provide specificity to which loci in the genome encode for tRNAs or ribosomal RNAs or RNAs that become mRNAs um, and, gene and eventually protein products. So RNA Pol2 has uh, a few 
characteristics in its um, promoter sequence to be aware of. And then there's a couple of things on this slide that I'm de-emphasizing because there's more detail than is needed for this audience. Two parts that you need to know of um, what initiates transcription through RNA Paul 2 is uh, this notion of an initiator sequence shown schematically here. The PYs are py pyrimidines. So the, the, um, the base is that either one of them is fine. CA and then transcription starts at this point here. So this is the plus one position, plus one on the coding strand. And then as you move in the three prime direction, the numbers increase. As you move in the five prime direction from the frame of the coding strand, you go negative. Therefore, the initiator sequence flanks the plus one, minus one position um, of the, the frame of the gene that's being transcribed. In addition, there is a sequence called a Tata box. It's a funny name. It's called Tata simply because it has a T-A-T-A -T -A in its consensus sequence. You see Tata. So the Tata box plus the initiator sequence together form what's called the core promoter. Meaning those two things together, they're immediately, ju they're closely juxtaposed on the, the sequence and it's right around the uh, transcriptional initiation site. And one can go further on and see these B recognition elements and downstream promoter elements. There's a few things, but you can already see that their consensus sequences start to get hazier and my passion for memorizing them fades also. All right, so let's keep close to the the, the transcription start side. How does RNA Paul 2 know that that's a core promoter? It doesn't recognize the core promoter itself. There are a class of proteins called transcription factors. We'll speak more about them in a little bit. But some of them will recognize that Tata box, bind to it. And then they also have a domain that helps recruit RNA Paul 2 So they have a DNA binding domain, and there, are and there are a variety of transcription factors that do this, but some will recognize the Tata box, bind to it if they have access to it. And then through another domain on that transcription factor, so-called transactivation domain, they will recruit RNA polymerase 2 to that locus, and then once RNA Paul 2 is down there, it sees the DNA, opens it up, and starts transcribing. More to say on transcription factors and enhancers and things in a moment. And that moment is right now. Um, we have a couple of different categories of transcription factors. And I think that there's a cartoon here. The transcription factor that I was um, referring to that binds to the, the Tata box is called TF2D, imaginatively transcription factor 2D. Okay. And what TF2D is, is it's a Tata box recognizer. And the reason why it's um, called a basal transcription factor is that if there's a Tata box available and accessible, it will bind to it. And there isn't any additional regulation on top of the transcription factor, aside from it simply being there. And if there's sequence there and it's available enough, then it will bind it. There are other transcription factors that have very elaborate um, regulatory architecture layer, layered on, on top. Some can depend upon their phosphorylation. Some are sequestered in the cytoplasm. Um, other ones are proteolytically degraded until the, they, um, until the inhibitor gets inhibited. Not TF2D. It's there. It's there all the time. If there's a locus where you see the Tata box, it'll be bound, bound to it. Um, so the binding of TF2D to that Tata bo box so will recruit other um, proteins to form collectively what's called a, a pre-initiation complex. So if you will, it nucleates what eventually will become a transcription event almost acting as a bit of a scaffold protein. So recognizing the DNA, bringing other um, factors in, forming this uh, pre-initiation uh, complex, po potentially involving other transcription factors, for example, the ones with the more elaborate um, 
regulation like I referred to a moment ago. And then as a result of forming a mature pre-initiation complex, the RNA polymerase II recognizes that, binds, and then it's off to the races transcribing RNA off the DNA. We have the cartoons with circles and clouds and, and things. In the next class, when I speak more about the regulation of transcription, you'll see how this, the formation of the pre-initiation complex, especially in eukaryotes, can get extremely complicated because where these different binding and recruitment events uh, occur is not necessarily right where the transcription start site is. It's not necessarily right in the core promoter. In my overview, uh, we finished with, we've made, we've synthesized RNA off the transcription unit. Let's talk more now about modifications. And these are modifications that are specific to eukaryotes. So here's the transition to uh, eukaryotic uh, processing of those pre-RNA transcripts that eventually will become messenger RNA. There are three that you need to be aware of. There will be slides on each of these in a moment. First is a modification on the five prime end of the transcript called the five prime cap. On the three prime end of the transcript, there is uh, what's called a poly A tail added. And then in the middle, there is splicing of that pre-RNA to remove these segments called introns and paste together these segments called exons to arrive at the final mature mRNA that is capped, spliced, and polydenylated. Although not in that order. I'll talk about the order um, in a moment. Five prime cap, what the heck is that? Chemical structure is shown on the right-hand side uh, to explain where it comes from. The five prime cap is the addition of a five, uh, excuse me, a seven methyl. This is the seven position of the guanosine ring here. So that's where this, the seven comes from, or M7G, or seven methyl guanine. Modification added to that five prime end. And the, you see on the slide here, it talks about the backwards five prime cap. Unlike the five prime to three, uh, the five prime to three prime linkages of the ribose sugars in the RNA chain, this is a five prime to five, pi five prime to five prime triphosphate bridge between the two, which if you're keeping the polarity in mind, as many was like turning around backwards, and uh, pasting it together. By virtue of the methyl on the guanosine and the backwards orientation of the um, nucleoside triphosphate, this creates a very unique uh, chemical structure on the five prime end of the RNA that's exploited by a, a family of proteins called cap binding proteins. Now we have the cap, and these cap binding proteins, when they recognize the cap, they can send signals to the cell to take that capped RNA and pull it out of the nucleus where it was transcribed and into the cytoplasm. It also helps uh, protect the RNA from exoribonucleases that would ordinarily chop down the ends, free ends of RNA. And when we talk about translation, you'll see how the five prime cap and cap binding proteins are uh, work together with the ribosome to inform where translation should start. This modification is an enzyme-catalyzed process by a capping enzyme. I right, need to know the name of the capping uh, enzyme. The one thing that I should emphasize, though, is that the capping enzyme is um, uh, associates with RNA Pol2 and only RNA Pol2. So this is an example of another uh, RNA polymerase protein interaction. And the specificity of it to RNA Pol2 is important because if you think hypothetically, if you capped transcripts of RNA Pol1, remember those are ribosomal RNAs, 
if you now put a signal on there to take it out of the nucleus, you're now taking it out of the nucleolus also, so you can't do a pop proper ribosome assembly. And we haven't shown anything about tRNAs, but you, in about a week you'll, you'll see they have a very precise secondary structure uh, to them, which would be disrupted if they happen to be capped. And so there's a, um, I want you to associate the capping to mRNA modifications, not all categories of RNA modifications. That's on the 5 prime end. What happens on the 3 prime end? Harking back to the slide that I spoke with you about transcriptional terminators, hairpin, secondary structure, all that jazz, right? The ribosome is moving along, excuse me, the RNA polymerase is moving along, transcribing, transcribing. It hits that terminator sequence. It has to be fully synthesized. It has to get out of the RNA polymerase cavity where it's uh, transcribing. The hairpin sequence needs to fold on top of itself and then it either needs to bind to the ribosome or bind to those intermediate proteins that then bind to the ribosome. Why am I walking you through all of those things? It takes time. And all that time, RNA polymerase is transcribing the rest of the locus. So what I described as a terminator sequence, it's not like the polymerase steps on the brake and stops moving. It keeps plowing on through. In many ways, by a uh, not well-defined stopping point, because it relates to the kinetics of how quickly the terminator hairpin can get recognized and cause the ribosome to run back. So that seems a little bit sloppy. And this is why the, the, the long-winded version of why the transcripts are often too long. And it's too long just because it kinetically, you have one enzyme thing happening and you have this binding and recognition that's happening at the same time. Cells ensure a more reproducible transcript length by using another consensus sequence and another post-translational modification that, in addition to uh, ensuring some uniformity in the transcript length, also helps protect the three prime end of RNA, akin to what the five prime cap was, like I talked about before. And that recognition is, occurs by a consensus sequence. I show you the cartoon here um, for what it is. That consensus sequence is called a poly A signal. I said before poly A, polyadenylation. That will become clearer in a while. When the poly A sequence is transcribed into RNA, so it's A, A, U, A, A. That's not blue, but it says a consensus sequence. There is a polymerase called poly A polymerase that recognizes that consensus sequence and does two things. First, it will chop off everything that follows with a couple of, you know, a dozen or two residues after that polyadenylation sequence. So all that gets chopped off. Therefore, if you have them longer or shorter, you've given all the RNAs a haircut and they're of a uniform size. Step two, which is where the poly A polymerase name comes from, poly A polymerase will then catalyze the addition of A's. A's, 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 A's. A lot of them. Uh, it depends on what organism, but uh, in yeast it might be 30, um, or excuse me, maybe 15 to 25. And in us, I think you're looking at 30 to upwards of 100 A's, depending upon which gene you're talking about. So there's some unclear mapping of why certain transcripts have longer poly A tails than, than others, but a lot of A's. What does the poly A tail do? I already alluded to this. There are a, this A modification um, will be recognized by another class of proteins, unimaginatively called poly A binding proteins, protect the three prime end, akin to the cap binding proteins on the five prime end. And um, what I'll speak to in a moment is that they work together with the cap binding proteins to ensure stability of the transcript in, in cells. Band. Okay. Um, Next time, just go for it. We're gonna, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, so your question is, you have four bases to choose from. What's so great about, you know, what's so special about A? I don't have a clear answer for you for that, aside from there was an enzyme that could rec recognize that sequence and, in addition, perform that catalysis. Therefore, off you go. Uh, you could make thermodynamic arguments that 
you probably wouldn't want one of the bases that has uh, the, the three base pairing. So G's and C's might be more apt to um, cross hybridize with RNA, other transcripts and things because of diter binding. But why A versus T, either of those seem perfectly fine um, to me. We have lots of, um, oh, okay, maybe one other argument. So note what the, the um, nucleoside triphosphate is, ATP. We have the highest levels of ATP compared to CTP, GTP, and TTP in cells because you need it as an energy source for all sorts of things. You've already seen it many times before. So there, you could make some catalytic arguments why that's a convenient substrate because there's a lot of it, millimolar amounts in our, in our cells. But these are, I'm trying to uh, not frame it as a design objective, but as a why that would be an, a, a convenient one to select for. Yes? Is the, uh, is the poly A tail terminating transcription or allowing trans a transcriptional termination to occur? Okay. Uh, so I th the first one, the poly A tail, does it uh, allow transcription to occur at all? The answer for that is no. Recall that we're on the th very three prime end of the RNA itself. All of the things related to transcriptional initiation happened at the five prime end. And by extension, to give a uh, more complete answer to your question, neither is the five prime cap important for transcriptional initiation. It, the modification occurs after the pre-RNA. In, in fact, it occurs after the pre-RNA has been fully synthesized, released, and then you have the capping. So it's a secondary modification. This is a secondary modification also after the terminator sequence has been transcribed, hairpin formed, um, RNA polymerase unbinding, and now you have a free pre-RNA. But before it exits the nucleus, you will have this modification. Yes? Yeah, so your question is how do you, um, how do these enzymes do the tango of being on the, you know, they're on the, the, the gene transcribing, there's RNA being made, and then things fall off, and then other things come on. How do you, how do, you do that? Um, let's talk about the termination event first. Hairpin form, biophysics, folding, you can do that in a test tube, you don't need anything, that's just base pairing. All right, so that occurs spontaneously, if you, if you will, by hydrogen bonding. Then you have a kinetic, there's a kinetics of the binding to the, the hairpin sequence. All the while, there's no signal for the RNA polymerase to unbind, so it's still elongating. When either the hairpin binds to the ribosome or the hairpin binds to one of those binding proteins that binds to the ribosome, what do you have? Allosteric change in the conformation of the ribosome. It has, you now have a protein, uh, protein complex that changes the conformation of the the RNA polymerase, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have mentioned anything about translation because I keep misspeaking there. RNA polymerase, conformational change, and now that's the signal for unbinding. So then the whole thing falls apart. Now you have a free RNA. There's, there are po uh, poly A polymerases floating around in the nucleus. If they see one of those free consensus sequences, they will recognize it and do the cleavage and polyadenylation like I talked about. Yes, it's going to be in the vicinity of the terminator. So the poly A um, uh, binding site and the terminator sequence are close to one another. Uh, the poly A binding site would be upstream of the terminator. So it, it, it's being made, but then you, it doesn't really, this, the poly A binding proteins don't have access to it until it's a free pre RNA. <laughs> If you hear me mix up a term, call me out in the lecture because it's much easier for me to fix it now than after that video recording is on YouTube. Um, so, over the years I've gotten pretty good at it, but I already caught myself I think two times today. <laughs> 
Okay. We have a, the RNA. It is capped, polyadenylated, so the ends are clean. Right? It's not pre, uh, pre-RNA anymore, all right, because it has these modifications. Well, what happens when you have a poly A? Here's the um, methylguanine cap. Here are the poly A binding proteins. This will eventually get exported out of the cell. I'm skipping over one step, but since we're talking about the ends, I should see how, say how they relate to one another. Um, there are, um, after the poly A polymerase has added the poly A tail, you have these poly A binding proteins that will coat that poly A, protect the three prime end from exoribonuclease uh, degradation. And there are these um, capping proteins that link the two ends of the RNA together to one another. So it's almost, uh, what would be the analogy? Like a Wild West analogy. Rounding the wagons. Okay. So there's no free ends for the, you know, for the natives to attack. Okay. They round it up, same idea. But what occurs over time, that poly A tail will get whittled away. There's a process called deadenylation that, depending upon the length of the poly A tail, sets the equivalent of a timer on the RNA. And once the deadenylation occurs, the poly A binding proteins are going to fall off because there's no poly A to bind. There are also decapping proteins that remove that 5 prime methyl cap. And when those two events happen, very rapidly, XRN or exoribonucleases inside the cell will chew up and degrade that RNA. There are exoribonucleases inside the cell all the time for protection against RNA viruses. RNA viruses, usually long linear RNA genome, we like to have exoribonucleases in there to try to chop them up. So I spoke about deadenylation linked to degradation and also related to the half-life of the RNA. So how long the tail is, there are other re regulations of how long that tail st sticks around, and so it's a level of what we'll call post-transcriptional regulation that determines the lifetime of the mRNA. The longer or the shorter the lifetime of the mRNA, the more opportunity there is to make protein or not. How are we doing so far? I had a couple good questions. All right. Next part, um, which is the final modification en route to a mature mRNA in eukaryotes, is splicing. This is the most complicated one. First, an introductory overview and a reminder of introns and exons. I believe this was in the in an overview since the last lecture that Professor Barker gave. The transcription unit in eukaryotes is not all gene protein coding sequence. There's a transcriptional start site here in this cartoon, reads through in a promoter here, all that fun stuff. RNA polymerase goes through and transcribes here, and then there's a terminator sequence somewhere over, over here. But that's not the mature mRNA, because inside it, there are segments in our genome called introns that don't encode a protein, uh, but are almost like space fillers in between the protein coding segments. So after the modifications of um, the capping and the polyadenylation, you have pre-mRNA, so it's a messenger RNA because of the cap capping and polyadenylation, but it's still pre because the splicing hasn't occurred. After splicing, the introns are removed, the exons are pasted together to give rise to the mRNA exported and then the cytoplasm. Now, wh what I have on this slide here is to uh, speak briefly about how do exons relate to the protein? Or why do you even have these exons? And you know, what would be the role of these exons in the, in the first place? Exons, the boundaries of the, the exons, um, frequently, normally, usually, encode separately folding protein domains in the final protein that gets translated. Kinase domains, what other things have you seen? Uh, protease domains. Um, 
any, any modular type of folded unit that has an enzyme activity or a binding activity, they form so-called modules, and those modules are usually embedded in one or a small number of exons. With that orientation, evolution has a collection of Lego bricks that you can flop around and do all sorts of fun things with. Okay, and this is how we have, why do we have 500 kinases in our genome? There was clearly one archival kinase that was really useful evolutionarily, so it just doubled, tripled, moved around, went hopping around in, in our very uh, long ago ancestral genomes, and then they diversify and speci specialize, and then they do different functions, okay? But that's not possible if it's such a huge segment that the likelihood of it jumping is, um, is sm small. So this exon, this exon organization is very conducive to moving bits and pieces of proteins together elsewhere in the genome. And it ties into the splicing machinery that I'll speak more about now. Another cartoon of the th same thing, simply zoomed in. I already spoke about the five prime methyl cap. First exon, shown there on the five prime end, Note that the numbering scheme is exactly the same, God bless you, uh, as the numbering scheme on the coding strand of the genome, reinforcing what I said. The, the numbers, though, you see they skip over the introns, because in the mature mRNA, they're not going to participate um, there. So this is how the numbers, if you, if you were to do some bioinformatics searches, genomes have been sequenced, many thousands of genomes have been sequenced. Um, and so this numbering scheme and the way you would look up an RNA transcript in the NCBI database, for example, will use the numbering scheme like I'm showing here. So omitting the introns when you look up a um, nucleotide sequence of a gene. How does the cell remove these intronic pieces of sequence and then reliably paste the exons together? Oh, one other thing before I dive into that, getting back to this modularity. That's it. Uh, there was a slide in Professor Barker's last lecture about transcript variants and how alternative splicing. Same idea with the Lego bricks. So you can leave out a domain. So this one has a kinase. This one doesn't have a kinase, yet it has all the other binding interactors. Same type of plug and play that could happen in the genome can happen through the alternative splicing machinery. To achieve splicing, there is sequence information encoded in the pre-mRNA transcript. And then there are also a whole variety of um, RNA-derived particles that together form what's called a spliceosome. The sequence information in the pre-mRNA transcript are called splice sites. So these are the boundaries in the earlier cartoon where the sh changes from shading of an exon to shading of an intron. Those demarcate the splice site. And then the spliceosome recognizes those splice sites, does chemistry on the pre-mRNA, and then yields the final spliced product. Unlike Tata boxes and initiator sequences, the splice site sequences are defined in a bioinformatic sense, but are very flexible and are not, they don't fit great into the definition that I told you about for consensus sequences. However, that said, there is an absolute requirement for this GU and AG sequence um, at the five prime and three prime ends of where the splicing will occur. So those are the intronic boundaries of something that gets spliced. But the, that's not a very restrictive sequence. There are many GUs and AGs everywhere in the, in the genome, but those are absolutely required. And the reason why they're absolutely required is because of the chemistry that I'll talk about. What is the spliceosome? The spliceosome is, a, is a, an assembly of multiple biomolecules. Some of them are proteins, but the, um, let's say, the real important ones, I don't want to say what one things are more important than the other, but the really essential ones for splicing to occur um, are RNA particles called SNRPs. I get to say Tata -ta and SNRP today. SNRPs stand for small nuclear ribonucleic particles, and these are 
an assembly of RNA that perform enzymatic functions. They're made by, um, depending, they can be transcribed by RNA Pol2 or Pol3, depending upon which SNRP that you're talking about. But the SNRPs recognize these two base sequences, they recognize one another, and they help promote the chemical modifications that are on the next, the next slide. Okay. What is the splicing reaction? Make sure that everybody's oriented. We have the first exon, second exon. Here's the intron with the flanking UG, a GU and AG sequences. There's one additional um, position here, which is not terribly well specified. It can be anywhere within the intron, called a branch point sequence. More on that in a moment. What occurs? You have recognition of this um, GU splice site by a U1 SNRP. I'll tell you what the U, it's like U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6, there's a whole bunch of them. Don't, don't worry about them. A SNRP recognizes the, the, um, the five prime splice site and will then uh, nucleate the assembly of the spliceosome together with another uh, SNRP that recognizes this branch, branch point sequence. So two SNRPs come together, recruit more, now you have a spliceosome. What does the spliceosome do? I think I have an animation for this. Yes, okay. What the spliceosome is doing is putting the branch point sequence at A in proximity, this geometric pro proximity, topological proximity, to the GU splice site. Mm, there's a typo, the, the upstream of the GU splice site, it doesn't magically become an intron. This should all be, this is still exonic information here. Okay, still brown like it had your Catalytic attack of the A onto the GU, forming what's called a lariat structure, as shown here. So now that you have a covalent modification between the branch point sequence and the, um, the splice site on the five prime end. And then this exon, the three prime end of the exon is still associated with the spliceosome, but it's free in the moment that the splicing is occurring. Then, the three prime end of the exon attacks the other splice site sequence to form a covalent phosphodiester bond between the two exons and then releasing this, what is called a lariat structure of the intron. So the intron was like this and now it's folded up on top of itself. And where they fold up on top of itself, that's where that branch uh, point sequence was originally located. These intronic lariats don't have any capping, don't have any polyadenylation, and by virtue of that are rapidly degraded by the ribonucleases that I talked about. So they don't last, God bless you, they don't last very long at all inside the cell, so they go, go away. And this process is iterated at each intronic junction in the pre-mRNA sequence. And you could envision in the scenario of alternative splicing, how you could have this splice site sequence, the GU, coming together with the AG of another intron, and now you've kicked out exon two. You splice it out or you splice it in. And this relates to the conformation of the pre-mRNA in the cells and, and the, the propensity of the spliceism to form certain junctions, and this is how you can get changes in a cell type specific manner. You can get changes depending upon which individual copy of the transcript uh, you're, we're talking about in the, in the cells. But this is the gist of the chemistry of splicing. I've covered what I aspired to cover today. We have five minutes. I covered a lot. Are there other questions? Ah, yeah, great. Your question is um, transcription as I've introduced it today. It seems like it really only involves the template strand with respect to the information that's needed by RNA polymerase to make the RNA. What I didn't say, which is why I'm happy that you asked this question, all of that stuff, everything that I talked about can happen on the other strand in the opposite direction 
if the information, if the template strand is in the, on the other strand. In other words, let me uh, draw. Three prime, double strand template. If you go into certain genome browsers and, and, and things, you, you may see a shorthand. I think I have an example of this next, next lecture, but I'll, I'll show it here now, where you may see something like this. Uh, MTUS1, just as an example. An arrow like this would indicate this is the transcription start site for MTUS1, meaning RNA com comes in. But what is it? And it's drawn this way, but it's the, the transcription is really happening on this strand. It's just in the coding coding strand uh, direction. Okay. Here I'm making something up, but it, this occurs. I don't know if it occurs with mtus one. You could have another gene. What other gene do you know? I don't know. Hemoglobin. Transcribed off the other strand. And, it, and they actually, even though they, it could appear that they're overlapping, they don't have to be because if the exons of uh, this gene are in the introns of this gene, now you have, if you will, twice the coding capacity of the same nucleic acid sequence. And there are examples of this where one gene and another gene partially overlap when you look on the double-stranded double, the double -stranded sequence. And certain like DNA viruses and other things can be very dense in this way, where you have overlapping transcription start sites, double, triple use of the genetic information in different contexts, depending on how it's, how it's regulated. So you can shift those starts. You can use both strands, and everything holds. It's just run in reverse. It's just run in the opposite orientation. All right. Have a nice weekend. I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>